championship game. I want to welcome our West Division champion, Western Michigan Broncos. I want to say thank you for that time this afternoon. We had Coach P.J. Fleck, wide receiver Corey Davis, and quarterback Zach Carroll. We'll go ahead and let the Coach open with a uh, comment, and we'll take questions. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Ken. Thank you to the Mid-American Conference. We're very honored uh, to be here in Detroit to represent the West Division of the Mid-American Conference. It's been a heck of a year. It really has. Uh, not only for our football team, but to be honest with the whole city of Kalamazoo, it hasn't been the easiest year of 2016. And if we could shed some type of hope, some type of light um, on our city and our, our, our university uh, from a lot of things that have happened throughout the year, then we've uh, done a pretty elite job of that so far. And I say so far because we're not done yet. There's a lot to accomplish. It's been a year of the firsts. Uh, last year was a year of the nevers. This is more of the year of the firsts. Uh, I think last year we had somewhere around 27, 28 nevers, what we call them. It never happened in a program history. This year, uh, a lot of our, our players said, wow, I mean, how can we get to even more than that? Right now we have 49 uh, firsts that have never happened in the history of the culture. Uh, or the program that we're very proud of with all due respect. Uh, we're just very proud to be back here in Detroit and uh, really looking forward uh, to the game tomorrow. We have an elite opponent, Frank Solich and the Ohio Bobcats, who did a tremendous job in the East. Frank's a Hall of Fame coach in my mind and just one of those guys that have consistently uh, proven to put his team to the upper echelon of the league year after year after year. And it's no surprise they're here in the MAC championship as well. I'm very proud of our football team, very proud of our players with the all-max selections. We're very honored to have 14 of those and uh, all well-deserved from the first team, second team, third team to the players of the year, which I'm sure you'll get to and you already are informed of that. But it really is just a special year. It's one of those years that come along that you just really want to enjoy. And I hope our players truly look back on this season when it's all done and over with and really have those moments and memories to share with their families, their children, their grandchildren one day. This is what sports is all about. And pulling out of Kalamazoo today and having the whole street lined with uh, our city was very powerful. I was even informed there was one guy who ran out of the woods on 94, exit 82, literally out of the woods uh, with a Western Michigan flag. So there's a guy out there in the woods with a Western Michigan flag. Just be aware of that. Um, but it really has shown where we've really come from three and a half years ago being 1-11 and 11, to where we are right now at 12-0. and 0. It's a credit to our players, it's a credit to our culture and our coaching staff and our entire city of Kalamazoo. It just shows the power of people. Uh, when you have the right people and the right vision, anything's possible. And we're very proud to represent the West, uh, the West. very proud to be at Western Michigan University with our team, and uh, very proud to be here in Detroit. So that's my opening statement. With that, uh, we'll open up for questions. Uh, I mean, it's not very challenging, you know. Um, you know, we understand our opponent, and uh, we know that they're, you know, a very elite opponent. And um, you know, we're just pretty much focusing on what we can control and focusing on us. Um, I wouldn't really say it's very challenging, you know. Um, we've come so far, you know, ever since that 1-11 season, and uh, you know, these guys have worked, you know, extremely hard ever since then, and uh, you know, we're ready for it. Yeah, I think what he talked about, the, uh, we can't control the uncontrollables, and uh, we're going to focus on us, and we're a process-oriented team. Uh, we focus on the work that we put in each and every day uh, to change our best and to grow higher, and that's really all we can control. We can't control what the Ohio Bobcats do. We can't control the rankings and all the pressure on the outside media. No one's going to put more pressure on us than we put on ourselves, and we're going to continue to do what we've done to get here, and that's learning from our past and growing higher and changing our best. There's a lot of differences. First and foremost, you're not out recruiting. You're preparing right, as a coaching staff, which is a little bit odd because there's not many teams playing this week. Uh, and I talked to our players about that, of how fortunate they are to be playing this week. You know, There's not that many teams playing for championships, and we're one of them. And I think you have to embrace that. And there's a lot of challenges that go along with that, but there's a lot of positives as well as you continue to go. Uh, but again, it's the preparation part. You know, you've got to make sure as you plan your schedule at, you know, only the sixth week of the season. Okay, what could happen if this and if that? 
So you're making many different schedules as you go through the year, just in case of different possibilities like we are now. Even as a head coach, you make calendars that are, you know, a year out. You know, you're doing that right now. So, uh, but I think the players have handled this exceptionally well. They really have. Uh, we've had some of our best practices this week. And when you start to talk about changing your best and growing higher and embracing your past to create your future, that's what this team's all about. It's not about one individual. It's about everybody collectively doing their job at an elite level and really sacrificing for one another. These guys love each other, and it's so fun to coach, and you don't want that to ever end. You know, so to extend it another week is a lot of fun. To be able to do that in the, I can't say the regular season, but the postseason championship week, it's really an honor to be here. It's very humbling, but it also shows the confidence these guys have in the culture, in themselves, and each other. But it's also humbling at the same time because you do want to enjoy it. Uh, and, and you know how hard it is to get here, and not everybody does that consistently. Why is so because they're selfless. It's the most selfless team I've ever been a part of. And that doesn't mean that every team here every year is going to be selfless from here on out. It's an individualized team. And it, it's how they relate to each other. It's how they talk to each other, how they respect each other, uh, how they challenge each other. We, we had a saying, you know, when, when, when your best players are your hardest workers, now you have a culture. That's what Corey and Zach have done. These are seniors that have really failed to grow. They haven't just grown because of successes. They've had to go through 1-11. and They've had to go through a lot of taking the blame, understanding what leadership's all about. Leadership's a very tough, lonely place at times. And they felt what that was like, even at a very young age. But they use those things, and they've embraced those things and those challenges to create their future into what you see today. That's what's fun about this team. That's what makes them special, is they've never felt sorry for themselves. At 1-11, and 11, at 8-5, and five, and a loss in the bowl game, to a 1-3 and three start last year and coming back and, and uh, winning our first bowl game in program history, uh, to this year. They've never felt bad for themselves. They've never judged themselves. They've kept everything on the outside the outside and educated themselves as we've gone through the program, taking one day at a time, uh, one motivation at a time, and uh, I'm very proud of them for that because that's what shows, that's how, what shows really the character of a football team is how you respond to those things. And these guys have done it flawlessly. It's been absolutely inspiring to watch them and how they do it. Yeah, the, the Uber shootings and then also the bicycle accident, uh, the deaths we had there. It's just hard. It's such a tight knit community. There's 150,000 people in about a six, seven mile radius. It's one of the most giving communities I've ever been a part of. So high the philanthropy. Uh, there's so many organizations that come to Kalamazoo to do a lot of their charity work. Uh, and it was a tough year. It was a tough year. And again, if we could give those people some type of hope um, and look towards the future and really believe in something and maybe get away from those types of issues on a daily basis, especially if you were truly affected by it. Not that you know our football team should be that important to you, but if you can at least find some joy in, in, in your city's football team, then we're doing our job. We're giving and serving, which is the number one thing in our program, about, uh, beyond anything else. Wins, losses, serving and giving is everything what this program's about. And if we can do that and make those people smile and bring joy to life for 60 minutes, then uh, that's what we're here to do. Hey, Coach, you talked after, Andy. Uh, hey, Coach, uh, after uh, game day. You were just so incredibly relieved that it was over. And you talked about being happy that you weren't the guy that screwed it up. And then I read your Players' Tribune article yesterday, and you talked a little bit about being the green button guy and always worrying. I'm just wondering if, if you can enjoy this. If you do, or you're always worried, you know, your mind's moving and worried about the next obstacle, or now you're finally here and you're kind of savoring it a little bit. Well, it all depends on what you're enjoying. You know what I really enjoy? These guys. I enjoy Corey. I enjoy Zach. I enjoy our, our kids as people. That's what I really take joy in. But when you talk about the process, it's very difficult to take a lot of joy in that part at that moment because as a head coach, you get paid a lot of money to be paranoid and worry and find solutions to problems. You know, like I said before, as a head coach, you're not just a guy. Everybody walks in and says, hey, hey, you're doing a great job. Yeah, I got this for you. I got Yeah, you're doing awesome. That's not what the media is about. That's not what people come in your office for. They come with problems, and they come to you for a solution. And so you're, you're, you're always thinking, and you're always moving. Your mind's always going. But that's why you're the head football coach. You get paid to do that. Uh, our calendar's done always, all, as of today, a year out in advance. I mean, your mind constantly moves. And if you stop to think about right now, you're going to miss a lot of things, right? But what I do enjoy right now are them. You know, that's, that's key. 
and we're going to enjoy our time on Ford Field uh, here at five. I think it's five or six o'clock, and we're going to have some fun, you know, and just enjoy the players because this is what college football is all about, right here. These guys, and these guys are the ones that deserve all the credit. I'll start by just saying, you know, it's, it, we want to be 1-0 and tomorrow. It's very simple for us, you know. Uh, we've told the players, and they, they understand, that, you know, we're not going to sit there and, t and trick them into something. They know how big this is. They, they're very mature. And they've been through a lot. They understand exactly where they are and how hard it is to get to this point because they haven't gotten here before, and now they're here. They know how hard that is, but they've also played in major big-time games with an incredible amount of expectation and incredible amount of pressure ever since 1-0 and at Northwestern, right? I mean, everybody all, all of a sudden started talking about undefeated when you were 1-0, and and they're telling these guys that, right? The question after Northwestern was, so you guys think you can go undefeated? I mean, we are 1-0, and right? And these guys have had to handle all those questions the entire year. But uh, I think it's phenomenal for the Mid-American Conference uh, to be able to have a sellout crowd, to have this type of hype for our conference. It's, um, it really is a feather in, you know, uh, John Steinbrecher's cap and, and Ken and everybody affiliated with the Mid-American Conference. So I'll let them answer how they feel, too. Oh, well, you know, like Coach said, we're looking to go 1-0 in uh, this Ohio season. Um, we understand our opponent, you know, like I said. And um, this week has been a, a great week and, uh, you know, great week of preparation. And, um, you know, we're enjoying the process and enjoying every step of the way. And, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to the game tomorrow. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is this is just fun. It's fun to be a part of this and fun to have this opportunity. And, and also to see the pride in the community, like Coach was talking about earlier, people lying in the streets. But I'm um, just kind of bringing back that pride to our university. And um, if we can do that and um, we can kind of get people to come back and see us play and a lot of people that haven't come in a while watch us play, um, there's no better feeling than that. And that's why we, we play football and just to have fun. And we're really excited about having an extra game. It's something we've never had. So especially this being Corey and I's last season, um, we're trying to get as many games as we can in before uh, – they tell us we can't play at Western Michigan any University anymore. Uh, PJ, following up on Andy's question uh, about the pressure that you've been under, when the Sparky Anderson said in 1984 that it's a tough year to be able to ask they got off a big start, they spent five years worried about screwing it up. Um, with you, was there more pressure in the, in, when you were 1 11 or more you know, worries than this year? Or like yeah, this year? They're very different in very different ways, I will say. Um, I will say this is when, when you're one in 11, what I've learned is it's very difficult because you're losing. Right. But at the outside world, right, the outside world, our media, which is the world they live in on their phone, the Twitter, the, the Facebook, the social media doesn't care that you're one in 11. No, you're not even the story. No one talks about you. Nobody wants to talk to you. And once in a while, people make a, a remark here or there. Or they'll yell something to you. But that's great. But our, our program is extremely positive. So they flocked at 1 and 11 to the positivity of the culture, even when we're 1 and 11. Like, how could this culture be so positive even when you're 1 and 11? When you become undefeated, there's a lot of positivity everywhere. There's positivity always in our culture, but then you worry about the positivity on the outside because that's where young people usually flock to, not the negativity, and there isn't much out there. So that's when you always worry. But the one thing these guys have done a tremendous job of is always bring things back to our culture, right? Uh, we've celebrated wins. You've seen us in, after games in locker room. I, we're not going to celebrate like we've been there before. We are going to have a lot of fun because it takes a ton of time and effort to get to that point. Then on Sunday, we always celebrate in our, in our, in our team meeting for about a minute. It's probably not as fun as they think it is. For me, it's very exciting. But we do celebrate. Uh, and then it's over. It's done with. And then we educate them how to handle the pressure and the expectations as you move forward. But the difference is when the outside world is really negative, you don't want to spend too much time out there. You, you flock towards positivity, and that's where our culture was at its best. But now with the positivity on the outside, you want to make sure they're hearing the right message all the time. And uh, that's why I love practicing in the mornings because you can start their day off with the message you want them to know and what to expect as they move forward throughout their day. Obviously, the playoff committee doesn't work very fondly tonight. You 
respond to that and your overall body of work? Well, I will just say this. All we're looking to do is go 1-0. and This is the number one team in my ranking, period. And that's the only thing that matters to me. I bet you that's the only thing that matters to Kathy Beauregard and everybody involved in the Western Michigan University organization and, and our community, period. And that's the only thing we can control. There's nothing else I can do or say and convince somebody to do anything. Our body of work speaks for itself. I think everybody understands how hard it is to go undefeated, even to get to this point, especially with the coaches that are on the committee, former coaches. But I'm not going to say anything that's going to make them think differently. Our schedule's our schedule. Our conference is one of the most competitive, in my opinion, one of the most competitive across the board with parity in the country. You never know who's going to win the league. Right? And, and any given Saturday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Maction, Friday, whatever it is, you just don't know who's going to win. And there's upsets all over our conference. And, um, and it really, everybody's at a very equal playing field, too, when you talk about funding, when you talk about recruiting. It's not like it's just, you know, you know this team's going to have this and this team's not. So, but we can't handle that. Whoever's on our schedule, we're going to take it one, one day at a time, one week at a time, and that's all we're going to control. And we need to be 1-0 tomorrow. Or, or it doesn't matter. Uh, Frank Solich was very complimentary uh, earlier about your very balanced offense. On the flip side, I want to get your take across the board on facing a defense that's number one rushing defense and has over 40 sacks and has the Mac Defensive Player of the Year. You know the guys are talking about. Uh, your thoughts on, on that challenge? Um, well, we understand that uh, they have a very elite defense, and um, you know, like I said previously, we're going to go out there and control. What we can control, and um, you know, we had an elite week of preparation. Um, we got after it, and um, you know, we're going to go out there and do what we do. Um, it's pretty much, you know, there's nothing really special about it. Um, you know, we understand that they're very elite on defense, and um, we're just going to go out there and just be us. That's all we can do. Yeah, definitely watching them. Um, their defense is is really really tough. And they're one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in the MAC. And uh, we recognize that we have a we have a tough challenge ahead of us. And um, that was very clear right off the bat, just looking at the numbers. And then as I got watching more and more film with Coach Shiraka and Coach Fleck and, and the boys, um, we continued to to really become clear that we we're going to have our hands full. And um, but we're we're looking forward to the challenge and. Um, we've approached this week like we have any other week, and that's focusing on us and how we can continue to get better each and every day. And like Corey said, we've had an elite week of preparation, and um, our guys are focused on what we can control, and that's us. And um, that's how we're going to approach this game. We recognize who we're playing and, and how elite they are, um, but we're going to continue to do what we've done all season, and that's worry about us. I don't think I've exhaled just yet. I don't think it. No, maybe they have. Uh, we're just focused on going one and zero in the Ohio season. Like Coach said, we have yet to exhale. Um, we have a lot left to accomplish, and um, there's a lot of things that um, we have left to do. A lot of meat left on the bone, so to speak, and uh, we have not exhaled. To answer your question. Uh, I mean, well, yeah, like Zach said, we have not exhaled. Um, we're heading in the right direction, and uh, you know we have. Another step to take, which is this next game uh, against Ohio, and um, you know, we're going to do what we do. And that's no disrespect to your question. That's just kind of the reality of the uh, of the culture, right? I mean, I think everybody understood once you won the first game and you beat a Big Ten opponent who's supposed to be pretty good. I think everybody kind of looked around. At least all of your questions were in the media. I mean, after that, I mean, that's what your questions were. With you guys got a chance to be pretty good. I mean, we, we knew we had a really good football team. I will say that we knew we had a really good football team going into this. And uh, you always have to win that first one, kind of get that thing going. You know where you're at after that first one. Well, yes, I would say they are our biggest challenge because their run defense is uh, the top in the league, right? Uh, but I think it, it goes into a few things. Brian Callahan, uh, Bill Kenny, Kenny Burns, Kirk Shiraka. Uh, incredible coaching staff on offense, especially when you're talking about running the football. And uh, Matt Simon, our wide receiver coach, you watch our wide receivers, they block. 
This, in my opinion, is one of the best blocking wide receivers in the country. I mean, he gets all this talk about him being a phenomenal player. That's true. But he's a complete player. And if you've got a player that's a dominating blocker plus what he does, the sky's the limit for him because he's so selfless. You know, he's going to show that no matter if I'm getting the ball or not, I'm going to play the game the right way. Uh, but our offensive line does a tremendous job. Our tight ends, you know, Donnie Ernsberger and Odell Miller are an incredible part to this offense, unsung heroes uh, that really don't get a lot of credit, but they're glorified fullbacks slash receivers. It's tough to find that body type. Uh, but I think it's, you know, we're not that complicated. We are going to run what we run, and we are going to know where you're going to be. Instead of having 15,000 run plays that, you know, these guru X and O things, we have our system. It's close to being the same system as 1 and 11. We got better players. They executed at a higher level, and they're way more mature. But I think with any really good running game, you better have a really good play action pass game. And I think that's where they come in. Um, you know, Zach has 30 some touchdowns and one interception. And I don't want to embarrass him, but I just want to make sure everybody understands how important and how hard that is to do. I know our running game gets a lot of credit, but think about that for a second. I mean, that is maybe the greatest statistic of the entire year in college football, and nobody talks about it. I'm not sure why, because I don't care who it is. Tom Brady in the NFL, I'm not sure if he even did that back in college. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Right? I mean, go back to Joe Montana. Did he do that in college? I'm not comparing those guys, but I'm saying the, the feat of having that shows that you have a guy that can run your offense. Not just a great playmaker. He runs the offense. He's another coach. He's a head coach and an offensive coordinator on the field playing for you. It's unbelievable. And um, so the credit goes to the players of executing and taking all that preparation and all that time into something that's very meticulous, very tedious, and, uh, and understanding that it's not just about the plays. It's about the fundamentals, the details, and it's about doing it together cohesively and collectively and everybody making sure that the run game is the focus. And uh, that's, I think, what they've done. So they've combined all those things. Yeah, I think the biggest uh, thing in your question was the balance aspect. And we do what we do, and we understand that the run game and the pass game, they have to, they have to work together. And a lot, we, we run the ball. RTB stands for run the ball. And um, we know what we're going to do every, every game. When we come out there, we're going to run the ball. And our offensive line knows that. They're the engine behind our offense. But we also know that in order for us to run the ball effectively, we have to be able to thre- um, be a threat down the field throwing the ball. That's where Corey comes into play and Carrington and Mike Henry and guys like that. We just try to be balanced. And um, when the defense tries to take one thing away, we, we do the other. And we just we try to be an unselfless team, uh, and a selfless team, and do whatever we can to, to be effective on offense, whether that's running the ball or passing the ball. We've come a long way as a program with two championships in 108 years to say championship or bust. We've come a long way. I, I actually like that. You know, I kind of like that expectation and that pressure. Uh, but we've come a long way to say, that, like, to say that. But that's what you want in your community. That's what you want to have. Um, but I, I really believe it. it's, it's not just coach speak. Uh, these guys have done everything we've asked them to do. It's one-game seasons, and that's what every coach in America – tries to get their team to do one game season but to get 105 players that are 18 to 22 to actually do that and believe it and buy into it that's that's hard that's very difficult and to not let them exhale and say you know what this is good enough but when you're one in 11 you're the worst team in college football and you still have that memory and that moment in your mind you don't focus on it but when you have that you want to create something different and you know what it's going to take to get there You got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll first uh, say this. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, defense wins championships. And when you look at the two teams that made it to the Mid-American Conference Championship, their defenses are 1-2, right? And you look at Frank Solich. I mean, he's an old-school ball coach. 
I mean, he's one of the most legendary coaches in college football. He understands defense wins championships, and that's really I'm, – I'm sure I'm not speaking – maybe I'm speaking for him or I don't mean to, but I'm sure he knows that's what got him here. I understand as a head coach, defense got us here, right? I mean, as much as our offense plays and how many points they've scored, the defense had to play elite all year for us to be able to have the possessions, have the turnover margin that we have. Um, you know, we're five, we've turned them over five times on offense, but think about it, we're plus 18. Think how many turnovers we had to get. And that's a credit to Keon Adams coming off the edge. Uh, he is one of the most explosive players, I think, in the country, let alone our conference. Um, he's very explosive. There's two defensive ends in this game that I think are two, or, two of the best ones in the country. And uh, they're number 93, and then obviously Keon Adams for us. And, uh, but Robert Splain stripping that ball uh, at Northwestern. I mean, they're going in to score, everybody. And, and we're 0-1 right out the gate if he doesn't strip that ball. But nobody really saw Sam Beal, you know, the, the true sophomore corner who, who is a thin guy, come up and hit him, hit the running back low so he would jar the ball a little bit loose, and that's when Robert could get it out. The one thing I love about our defense is they're very opportunistic, uh, and they understand the ball is the program. They're a suffocating, swarming defense. But that's what Ohio is, and, and that's what I really respect about them and have a ton of respect for them is they play defense the right way. And it's fun to watch defensive elite football in 2016. And when you put Frank Solich's film up there, that's what you see. And it's pretty neat to see that in 2016 with all these fancy offenses scoring all these points. It's really neat to see that his defense has shut down a lot of these offenses. And it's a credit to him and it's a credit to Ed Pinkham, you know, our, our staff, uh, Jimmy Williams and David Duggan, our GAs, and all of our defensive players because they couldn't do it alone. But again, same type of team. And Keon Adams you're talking about was 1-11. You know, he understands what it was like to have 70 put against you against Iowa or 60-some put against He played in that game, right? So uh, you've got to give credit to our defensive coaches, though. They've really done a tremendous job of molding these players together, and they play really well in sync and cohesively. So you're going to make me say nice things about Coach Fleck? No. About how you feel. No, I mean, obviously, I mean, what Coach Fleck has done for me is probably undescribable. And it's something that you may not be able to really describe because it's something that all the things we've been through together and, you know, the coach and quarterback relationship is there's really nothing like it because, like, Coach – always says we get more credit than we deserve and we get more blame than we deserve but that just comes with the job and I was right there with him when we were 1-11 when he was the worst head coach in college football and I was the worst quarterback in college football and um, now we're, we're still together and we're those same people but we've grown a lot and I've learned a ton from him and he's been very open and honest with me which has allowed me to learn a lot and grow as a man and I've learned a ton about leadership and life and um, the, the things that I've learned from him and this program and this culture are invaluable. And they're things that are going to take with me for the rest of my life. And um, I'll never be the same because of it. So I can't thank Coach enough for taking the chance on me and, you know, giving me the keys to the car. And um, like I said, I'm still enjoying the ride. And we still got time together. And I'm really enjoying it. But um, God definitely blessed me when he gave me Coach Fleck four years ago. Um, I mean, whenever you're in the same conversation as Randy Moss and Greg Jennings, you know, it's always a blessing. Um, just looking back and seeing no, not only how far I've come, but, you know, this entire program is, you know, it's very humbling. And, um, you know, I thank God every day for the position he put me in. And, you know, I thank God every day for uh, Coach Fleck and, you know, him taking a chance on a kid who, you know, didn't really have much and didn't really show much. Um, so, you know, it's just a blessing and, and it's just extremely humbling. So you know, I thank God every day. I just want to add, just so everybody understands, I think these are two of the best players in college football. And not are they just the best players or two of the best people you will ever meet in your entire life. 
And anybody that comes in contact with these two young men and has them affiliated with their life is blessed. And uh, it's amazing. DJ, you lived and preached the one game at a time. At this point, this one game season allows you to, the culmination of what the other 12 were all about. Have you talked with, you know, how do you approach that with, hey, this is a chance to make all those other 12s add up to what you're shooting for, that first max title? How do you do that without giving away from the one game season? Well, I think you got to be very open and honest, you know. I mean, this is it. This is the end of the road before a bowl game. So this is the last true regular type season game you have. And I don't ignore it and don't talk to them about it because, again, it's one of those things that if you, if you, if you ignore it, right, and, and it's like I always say this, and you've heard me say this before, it's like, it's like raising your daughters. If your daughter never hears she's lovely from you, from age two, three, four, five, all the way up to 15, 16. Next thing you know, she's out the door with the first guy that tells you, tells her she lo- you look lovely. Well, I've never heard that before. I'm going to go with that guy. Well, what about, you're my dad, but you never told me that. That's what we talk to our players about, right, is we're very real with them. You can't ignore this is a championship game. It's the biggest game, right, that we have all year. One, because it's the next game, but it means a ton. There's a ton on the line. But this is what we wanted. This is the expectation and, and the pressure we talked about from the opening press conference when we took over this job, period. And the vision of Kathy Beauregard. This was her vision. And these guys, this is what you get now if you come to play for Western Michigan. If you don't want the, the championship pressure and the expectations and the expectations to be ranked, don't come to Western Michigan. And these guys have handled that flawlessly. But again, they're still kids. They're still young people. And they're influenced by outside sources. You have to be open and honest, but you also have to be able to keep the culture at the forefront of everything you talk about. And that's what Row the Boat's all about. That's what One Game at a Time's about. That's what Changing Your Best is about. That's what Grow Higher's all about. To be able to give a little substance, right, to what they hear on the outside. Because they're never going to ignore it. They're going to embrace it just like anything else. But we want them to embrace it, but then bring it down into the culture funnel, and then what comes out of that is going to be pretty elite. And that's what these guys have done.